Okay, we're going to get launched here. So welcome to the 2020 Pitch Dingman Competition Virtual Edition. I'm Holly DeArmond. I'm the Managing Director of the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship at the Robert H. Smith School of Business, and welcome. Um, as you see on the screen, please be aware that this event is being video recorded. Thank you. So at the Dingman Center, our mission is to make entrepreneurs of all kinds more successful, even when we're experiencing a global pandemic. Um, these are unprecedented times for all of us, and it calls for extraordinary measures. And at the Dingman Center, that meant moving our annual live pitch Dingman competition to the virtual format that you see here today on Zoom. The competition was originally set for March 10th, but due to restrictions with COVID-19, we had to postpone. Our students had trained more than three months for their pitches, but their time in the spotlight was suspended. Our Dingman Center team remained committed to giving our students their time to pitch. And after many virtual brainstorming sessions and Zoom tests, we have created this virtual experience here this afternoon. So this year, more than any other year, um, our team has really stepped up to the plate. Um, the student journey and this competition would not be possible without the talented Dingman Center team. And Pitch Dingman is led by Sarah Harold, Lottie Byram, and Megan McPherson. You'll see them throughout this production. So thank you team for all your hard work. And to our finalists, no matter who comes out on top today, each of you have shown yourselves to be true entrepreneurs. Your hustle, resilience, and professionalism is to be commended. So congratulations to you all, and we can't wait to hear your pitches today. And thank you to everyone who, who logged on today. Uh, I know we have students, alumni, colleagues, members of our Demon Center, angels, members of our board of advisors, our mentor network. We have a lot of our community logged on to watch our students today, so thank you. But as you can see, we do have a very special guest with us online. Interim Dean of Marilyn Smith, Ritu Agarwal, has joined us. Um, Dean Agarwal is the Robert H. Smith Dean's Chair of Information Systems, and she's the founding director of the School Center for Health Information and Decision Systems. So now I would like to welcome Dean Ritu Agarwal to the screen to provide some brief remarks. Thank you, Holly. Good evening, welcome. It's wonderful to see everybody, albeit in a, a small little thumbnail on my screen, but hi everyone, it's great to be here and I'm so delighted to join you for this special edition of the annual Pitch Dingwin competition. Uh, as Holly said, uh, we are sorry we had to reschedule the plant event in March, but these are indeed unprecedented and extraordinary times. I will say that uh, as the Dean of the Robert A. Smith School of Business, I am so proud and pleased of the way our community has come together to respond to this crisis. And even in the midst of this crisis, we remain at the forefront of innovation and Tonight's competition is an example of how we pulled together and we've said nothing will stop us from fulfilling our mission and remaining connected with our friends and partners and our stakeholder network. As you all well know, the Dingman Center is the hub of entrepreneurial activity at Maryland Smith, where we are strongly committed to the belief that tomorrow's leaders must have entrepreneurial skills in order to be successful. For more than three decades now, 30 years, the Bingman Center has been creating some outstanding and award-winning programming that teaches our students how to be entrepreneurial. Our pitch Dingman competition tonight, hold your breath, is 10 years old. It feels like just yesterday, it feels like just yesterday that it was a small event in a classroom where, you know, a handful of teams got together to compete for a few thousand dollars. And look where we are today. Uh, you know, hundreds of participants, more than $30,000 in funding being distributed. So, you know, kudos to Holly and the team, uh, kudos to uh, the Dingman Center and for all of our stakeholders, including our judges and participants and our advisory board for all of your hard work and dedication. 
Uh, I would not be doing my job as Dean of the Smith School if I did not say a few words about the Smith School. I uh, want to remind everybody that we take immense pride in being a world-class institution. Uh, and we provide a transformational experience to our students. And I will share with you tonight uh, what I think are the three key ingredients of our very, very secret sauce. Not so secret anymore because it's being shared with, uh, let's see, 290 participants is what we have on the screen right now. But anyways, so the three ingredients of our secret sauce, a leading edge curriculum and the Pitch Dingman competition is a big piece of that curriculum. Outstanding faculty, many of whom are uh, here tonight, who are world renowned thought leaders in their discipline and a very special student experience. We call it the Smith experience, you know, which brings together a variety of co-curricular activities combined with that leading edge curriculum to truly provide a robust and rich learning environment to our students. Uh, so I want to uh, stop here because I know you didn't come here to listen to me and um, I want to turn it over to Holly. I want to say good luck to all the five finalists pitching tonight and to of course all of the um, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience. Um, break a leg as the saying goes and go Terps. Thank you Holly. Yes, thank you Dean. Yeah, go Terps. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, I would also now like to extend my appreciation to our Pitch Dingman competition partners who have stuck by us as we determine how to move forward this year. David and Robin Quattrone have supported our competition for many years and they provide the funding for the grand prize given out here tonight. The second place prize is provided by Parsons Ventures. While our longtime partner CQ provides a stipend to all of the five teams that you hear pitching here tonight. So they were very patient with us as we figured out how to move forward. So we appreciate their, their continued support. Um, but to give you a little background on this competition, it begins in the fall semester with our Dingman team scouring the campus to find qualified student entrepreneurs to apply for the competition. After the applications are in, we actually use alumni from across the nation who log onto a platform and help us score all the submissions. And from there in November, 10 teams pitch for a space in the top five finalists group. So from December until now, these five finalist teams have attended venture acceleration workshops, and they've also had a coach who's been offering guidance along the way. The coaches play a big role in the finalist journey. So I do wanna take some time to thank each one of them. And I know a few of them are logged on with us today. So we have Jennifer Hassan, who coached Door Robotics. We have Maurice Boissier, who coached Bracelet. Phil Mazziolo, who helped Algen Air. Then we have Adam Van Wagner, who coached the Hyde Race team. Polly Vale and Colin Gilchrist, Coach Sweets by Caroline. So thank you so much, coaches, for sticking um, with our teams and helping them prepare for a virtual pitch. And so I want to give the audience an idea of what um, the students are pitching for today. So this afternoon, the founders are competing for three prizes. Um, the top prize is the $15,000 David and Robin Quattrone Pitch Demon Grand Prize. Like I said, the second place provided by Parsons Ventures is 7,500. And then we have third place with 3,500. And so like Dean Agarwal said, we'll give away um, more than $30,000 by the time the competition ends. And so now I would like to explain how the pitches will work. So each team will deliver a six minute pitch followed by a four minute Q&A. The Q&A will be with judges only. We don't ha have enough time to open that up to the audience. We have listed on this screen the criteria the judges will use when they're deliberating. And as you can see, these founders have a lot packed in that six minute pitch. I would now like to recognize our panel of judges. First up, we have Matt Fischlinger. He is the founder and chief operating officer at Gramercy Risk Holdings. Aurelia Flores, who is the managing member of Athena Digital Media. 
Tom Parsons, president of Parsons Ventures, Inc. We have Angela Singleton, who is the director of Tedco's Builder Fund. Becky Smith, who is EVP and Chief Strategy Mark and Marketing Officer at CQ. And David Quattrone, co-founder and CTO of Cement. So thank you for serving as a judge under these new and unexpected uh, circumstances and your support along the way um, is appreciated. So that's enough for me for opening remarks. I'd like to move on to the competition. Now, this is our first virtual pitch competition, so please bear with our team as we navigate this, the technology. But first up is the Algin Air team. They'll provide the first pitch of the afternoon. So I'm going to throw it to Lottie and the Algin Air team. All right, Algin Air, are you ready to go? You can go ahead and start your screen share now. <laughs> okay, here we go. I think we're all set here. Okay, uh, I, I, I hope that everybody can hear us. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. All righty, thanks a lot. Uh, hi, my name is Dan Fusich. And I'm Kelsey Abernathy. And we are the co-founders of Algin Air. We help people grow algae so that they can live better. And I wanna first start out by having everybody take a deep breath together. Now let's think about what we just put into our bodies and where did it come from? Well, first there's oxygen. And the only reason that oxygen is in your lungs is because of algae. Algae put it in the atmosphere two and a half billion years ago. There's also carbon dioxide. And since I know that you're trapped indoors right now, that those levels can be two to three times higher than what is naturally occurring outside. That's detrimental to your health. It causes respiratory problems at a time when respiratory health has never been more important in human history. And it's inescapable because we're trapped indoors 90% of our day. And currently the state of the art is to let as little fresh air as possible to do just barely enough to prevent us from getting sick. And we think there's a better way. That's why we made the Arium. And it's the world's first natural air purifier that uses algae to clean the air we breathe. And it works with incredible simplicity. We take carbon dioxide rich air from inside of this room, we pump it into the Arium. And once inside, it meets millions and millions of algae cells. And those algae cells, they only have two jobs. Number one, they suck up carbon dioxide. And number two, they actually release oxygen. And they do that as effectively as 25 houseplants. So we can get an IRM unit to your doorstep for $175. The alternative is that you have to go outside into the big scary world. You have to spend upwards of $300 on plants. And congratulations, you just bought yourself a job, right? You have to care for these plants. You have to water these plants. You have to feed these plants and half of them are just gonna die for like no reason. So with the patent pending Arium, you can do the same thing for a, for a fraction of the cost, the time, and the space. And direct sales are the first column that supports our business model. Now to ensure that your algae is growing as efficiently as possible, we do offer a subscription service for $25 every two months. And what you get at your doorstep is fresh algae, you can even change the color if you'd like, proprietary food for that algae, and replacement filters. It takes just five minutes to recycle your algae, and after that, you can sit back and enjoy fresh, clean air for another two months. Now, future iterations of the Arium will have integrated sensors and IoT capabilities, so we can get push notifications directly to our customers' phones with the exact date and time that they can change their algae. It's a feature we're excited to roll out across the country because quite literally, we have shipped Arium units from coast to coast, and they are cleaning customers' air as we speak but that's just the beginning. As a molecular biologist, I've seen how algae can fundamentally transform this planet. And in Algin Air, we're excited for it to improve our future because you can use an Arium not only to clean just one room, but an entire floor, and we can make living, breathing buildings. The Arium is part of the $4.7 billion smart air purifier market. 
An emerging segment of this market space is natural air purifiers, which sits at the intersection of HEPA filters and indoor gardening. We believe we can capture $100 million of this market space as we lead the way in developing algal purification technologies. Since this is a relatively new space, we went through the NSF i Customer Discovery Program to identify our two target customers. The first are millennials who are purchasing plants to improve their indoor air quality. There's over 5 million new millennial indoor gardeners every year. The second is mothers aged 35 to 45 who consider indoor air quality a top safety concern. There's 21 million mothers in this age bracket in the U.S. alone. And we're attractive to these customers because of our competitive advantages. Traditional air filters can remove dust, mold, bacteria, but they cannot remove carbon dioxide. Meanwhile, plants and other natural air purifiers can remove CO2, but nothing else. The Arium does both. It has an inline filter that's superior to HEPA standards, and it can reduce carbon dioxide and increase oxygen as efficiently as 25 plants. We launched the pre-sales in late fall of 2019 and have shipped Ariums across the country. With improved manufacturing and economies of scale, we can grow this company over 100-fold during the next five years from 500 to 50,000 units annually. The team bringing this product to market is Dan and myself. We're both PhD candidates who plan to go full-time when we graduate. Our research focuses on algae. We're huge algae nerds, and we have built this company completely from scratch, doing all of our design and prototyping in-house and raising over $62,000 in non-equity, non-dilutive funding. But we know we have weaknesses, so we've assembled a team of advisors and mentors to guide us along the way. And we've partnered with two great Maryland companies, American Bully Manufacturing and Arnold Packaging, to manufacture, assemble, package, and ship our product. We're so thankful to the Dingman Center for all their help. And if we're able to access these funds, we can move Algenair forward in three strategic ways. First, with our current customer acquisition costs, we can turn $8,000 in marketing into $45,000 in revenue. Next, with $5,000, we can upgrade our electronics to a custom printed circuit board. This will not only reduce our cost of goods by $10 per unit, but it will enable us to build a better product faster. And finally, we're incredibly excited to announce that we've partnered with The Hotel at the University of Maryland to pilot test Arium units. This is a great opportunity to gather real world data as hotels consistently have some of the highest CO2 concentrations of any building. Algae is going to change the future. It'll be integrated into architecture as well as fixtures in our home and office space. The patent pending Arium is the first step so that we can help people grow algae and live better. Thank you. Thanks, Algenair. Nicely done. So now we'll move on to the Q&A portion, which Megan will monitor. David Quattrone has a question. Yeah, uh, can you can you give me kind of the competitive landscape for more traditional HEPA filters and so forth when you talk about maybe annual total cost of ownership? Like, where does this fit in to what you might be able to go on to say Amazon right now and buy versus you know what your your filter will offer? Yep. So there's a wide range when it comes to air filters, uh, and the average that we found was around two hundred dollars, which helped set our price point for being one seventy five, which is below that. The standard for HEPA filters is 0.3 microns uh, in terms of the filter size. Our internal filter is 0.22, so we're actually exceeding that standard. Aurelia Flores has a question. Hi, I've got a um, couple questions about your business model. So you talk about getting 10% um, of the market, which is like 100 million users. And yet when, we're, when you were talking about the five-year time frame, you've got 50,000 um, per month sales. Tell me a little bit about how you're going to capture that much of the market when the two market segments you talked about were 21 million and 5 million each. Just trying to understand how these numbers match up. So the two market segments we're talking about are HEPA filters, which is a 700 million U.S. market, and indoor gardening, which is a 500 million dollar U.S. market, which is where you get the 1.2 billion um, for kind of natural air purification. It's such a new market space, they don't have actually defined market data on it right now. Um, in terms of capturing it, it will involve not only Arium sales, but being able to use this technology and as Dan mentioned, uh, scale it to devices that can clean an entire floor and eventually entire buildings, which is what's factored into that $100 million. Thanks. I'm gonna take over for Megan because it looks like her internet might be down. 
Uh, let's go with Angela. Hi guys. Um, that, it's a very delightful design. It's very calming and therapeutic. Um, I'd like to understand though, with respect to the competitive landscape, how do you support your claims that you are as effective as uh, the use of 25 plants? What kind of testing are you doing? Yes, so uh, as far as the carbon sequestration abilities of plants versus algae, uh, fundamentally, algae don't have to fight gravity and things like that. So order, orders of magnitude more efficient in carbon sequestration. So with the amount of algae that we can actually grow in this amount of space, 1.7 liters, uh, that equals the carbon sequestration power of the top carbon sequestering plants, like prayer plants who people buy these plants for the sole reason of carbon sequestration. As far as testing, we have, of course, calculated the potential carbon sequestration, but we are working on tests uh, to essentially seal boxes and then measure the carbon, carbon concentration and just watching that uh, decrease over time at laboratory scales as well as real uh, lifelike spaces such as the hotel. So we can actually watch in real time how the Arium can actually perform in a, a 10 by 12 room. Thanks. Last question, judges. Um, I'll take Becky. Oh, sure. So, okay. Um, I'm not sure if I caught this in there. I saw how much um, you would be selling this for. Did you talk at all about how much it costs you to produce? Um, and then follow up to that too is how often does someone need to change the algae and how much would you charge for that? So, uh, the Arium, which is patent pending, uh, retails for $175. We can make it for 96, giving us a 45% profit margin. Uh, this margin will only improve with economies of scale. Right now we're doing small scale manufacturing. The customer will buy a replacement of new algae, algae food and filters. It'll be shipped to them for $25 every uh, two months. And this costs us $12 to make, including shipping and everything which is a 52% profit margin. Thank you. All right, time's up. So judges will give you just a minute to kind of jot some notes for yourself while Bracelet gets ready. Thank you so much for your time, audience thank you. judges. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Dan, you can get your screen share up whenever you're ready. All right, judges, are you ready? Give us a nod. All righty, go ahead, Bracelet. As you know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. We have all had those moments where we've needed to dress our best, only to have it ruined and our confidence shattered. Last fall, I was on the way to the interview of a lifetime. I was fully prepared and dressed to impress, but when I went to do my final check in the car mirror, I realized that my dog, Jess's hair, was covering my suit. I searched the car for a lint roller or the last resort tape before realizing I had run out of time. I had to pick myself up and walk into that office, noticeably dirty, and completely defeated. Hi, my name is Daniel Rathel, and I'm the founder of Bracelet, a company that is here to keep you looking your best once you're out of their house with our single-use, pocket-sized, and patent-pending lint roller. Being a former Marine, realtor, and pet parent, I realized the importance of professionalism at an early age, but always hated avoiding my animals from dressing for the occasion. I would use lint rollers at home, but could never take them with me. They're too bulky to put in briefcases, get stuck to paperwork in the glove box, and are always covered in dirt and hair. In recent years, there's been a push for more portability with lint rollers, but no one has done it right. Products like Highwood Secrets, despite needing five sheets to clean a single garment and being hard to use, have made it all the way into Targets and Walmarts, showing that the market is looking for something that will stick. I'm excited to introduce to you the patent pending solution to the lint roller, the bracelet. Bracelets are individually wrapped and sold in 10 packs, allowing the user to take one with them anywhere, even in their pocket. This on-the-go quick fix for pet parents and frequent travelers alike allows you to focus on the most important moments ahead without having to worry about what your clothes might pick up on the way there. They're incredibly easy to use. Simply prop open, slide into the wrist, remove the paper backing, then roll down your body the same way you would a lint roller, cleaning your clothes with just a single sheet. Once you're done, they're completely disposable. We are fortunate to have a broad array of market applications and have addressed both the immediate and prepared needs of consumers. Imagine being crunched for time in that same interview scenario and having a 10-pack in the glove box. 
or going to a convenience store like 7-Eleven, picking up a pack and getting your mojo back. Possibly even more exciting is our white collar market. Convenience product providers like hotels currently do not stock lint rollers for their guests due to their bulky storage requirements. Adding to this, the promotional product market gives additional revenue streams. This is the free swag giveaways at trade shows and conventions where branded bracelets can be given out by organizations as a note of professionalism, all the while giving off that squeaky clean feel. These are potentially massive and reoccurring revenue streams that bracelet is positioned to fulfill while gaining exposure. The market potential is huge. After completing customer discovery with over 200 people during Turf Startup, pet parents were found to have the most immediate need with 85 million and growing households in the US alone. Coupling this with white collar workers gives us an estimated 60 million in the United States. This is the immediate market that I am currently attacking. In fact, in the month before the great rest when we launched, the market helped to validate some of my underlying assumptions. In a one day sales sprint, I was able to get into six boutique pet shops in Alexandria and began to auction the medium sized firm. Sold over 170 over the website and received three purchase orders from hospitality firms totaling 3,000 single units. This all equates to $2,300 our very first month. When business cycles return, I will be continuing this by selling throughout the DC area where there are over 280 pet stores within a 10 mile radius. Adjusting our model for an immediate focus on e-commerce, we see a very promising future for Bracelet despite the oncoming recession. I've made substantial progress since the semifinals. I was able to obtain my international provisional pen and increase my profit margin by 25% when accounting for labor. This was done by improving my manufacturing process and the material itself. At the current scale of 2,500 units, the cost of producing a 10 pack is $1.01. With disposable income decreasing, our low price point of $6.99 gives us an incredible 85% profit margin for direct sales, making organic growth a viable option while keeping the barrier to entry low during trying times. If one, most of the capital will be dedicated towards growth opportunities to assist in driving demand. I have fully bootstrapped and soloed this company so far with the help and guidance of the Dingman Center. But now that production is more stable and autonomous, it's time for me to hire my first employee to assist in marketing, focusing on e-commerce, namely Amazon. Amazon will be a large driver of growth in the future for Bracelet with a projected $1.3 million in revenue by 2022. This will also help to build validity when approaching the larger size chains during the Super Zoo Pet trade show. I've put everything I have into this company and I'm excited to be able to continue on with this journey full-time after graduating. I want to thank you all very much for your time and invite everyone to come roll with us at Bracelet and leave no puppy on pet. Thanks so much, Dan. We'll move now to the Q&A. Angela Singleton has a question. So Dan, I get it, you know, so I totally do this type of individual packaging with my lens wipes for my glasses. So I can see how I'd want to do it with my apparel as well. Um, what I'm curious about is that you said it's patent pending. And I think I heard you say that you've secured some international um, patents. Um, what's claimable at this point? Um, what is the strength? What are the strength of the claims that you have? Uh, and, um, you know, what's the outlook for securing those claims? Yes, absolutely. So at this time, um, I did go for my U.S. non-provisional at first, and then to extend my provisional time, I went for my international provisional patent as well. The claim is for a completely flat-fitting lint-removing device. David Quatrone has a question. Yeah, I guess it's, it's on the competition, you know, as a, as a, as a pet pet owner and someone that would uh, use a tool like this. Uh, I did see that in your, your competitive slide, you did have, I think it was more of a fashion design type of a uh, handheld swipe tool. Is that the, the competition versus the old bulky ones? I'm just trying to understand again, what options are there for a more portable solution today um, out there in the market? Yes, absolutely. So of course you do always have your travel size lint rollers, which you're able to go ahead and throw in. But the problem is for traveling salesmen, I used to be a real estate agent. 
have to go from place to place and refresh ourselves from time to time. I love taking my dogs on a walk. So basically what I needed was a completely portable version that would be able to fit in the pocket. And there's nothing remotely close on the market. The closest thing is a smaller container that um, branches out, but it's still around three centimeters in diameter. And it takes a lot of sheets to use. See, the problem with the portable versions, they have a much smaller diameter. So you need to use multiple sheets instead of the one large one. So you end up going through a massive amount before you actually get the job done. Becky Smith has a question. Sure, so um, how long, I imagine with the price point of, I think you said $6.99, um, you've either got to sell to a lot of people or the same people and over and over. Um, how long does one of these last, would you say, on average? Um, how often are consumers replenishing? So right now, unfortunately, we've only launched for one single month, so I don't have a lot of data point on other consumers. But for people like myself who constantly run into this situation, I'm using one maybe about, I, I would say on a uh, bi-weekly basis. I'm using probably around two a week because that's when I'm dressing up, I'm running out of the house and I'm actually going to take care of things in a professional nature. Aurelia Flores has a question. Um, talk me through again your product rollout. Yes. So you talked about Amazon and hotels and so forth and where are you going to focus first and, and what, just tell me what the trajectory is there. Absolutely. So before um, COVID happened, I was going towards businesses. I wanted to go ahead and build my validity by selling to as many places as I could, locking down boutiques, slowly making my way into chain stores along with uh, hotels, other places that I could have larger amounts to. But unfortunately, with the crisis that's happening right now, I'm going ahead and going full force on my e-commerce to be able to build the validity back out to reach those larger chains. I'm sorry, I think you might be muted. Who? I believe Matt Fischlinger has a question. Oh, Matt Fischlinger. No, you actually uh, really hit my question. It was more on the distribution, but you answered that with kind of your, I guess, your e-commerce e rollout now. Um, but anything more, I just kind of in the marketing itself, again, there's, um, yeah, you, you kind of, the, the competitive edge is that it's better and it's portable. Is there anything more in kind of the differentiation between the products or is it really the portability that's the main selling point? So the biggest portion is the portability. Um, beyond that, you should be using a lint roller at home. It's more cost effective and it makes sense. But the issue is once you're out of the house and you hit those emergency situations, you're going to that interview, you have that pitch in front of 350 people. And at the last second you realize I messed up. I have my dog in the car the day before. I need to fix it up. So more or less, it's just a portable alternative and the only one that actually makes sense. All right, thank you, Dan with bracelet. I'm seeing from Sarah that our time's up. Mark just went. Thank you very much. Awesome job. So we'll move on to Door Robotics. All right, Door Robotics. Are you ready to go? Yes, yes we are. So hold on for just a minute. Let's let the judges have a few minutes to write their notes, fill out their scorecards if they would like. All right, judges are ready. Give me a nod, give me a, a shake. Right. All right. Judges, judges. So, Door Robotics, when you are ready, go ahead and start. Okay. Hi, my name is Joshua Myers. And I'm Vincent Hauge. Our venture is Door Robotics. We are building the Vista, an integrated 360 degree camera drone. Now, commercial drones are most often used by people in the inspection space, the real estate photography space, and the 360 degree videography space. Now there are some issues with current solutions in the market. Let's start with some examples. In the inspection space, Bob has to turn off his smokestack at the power plant facility and hire someone to rappel in and perform a visual inspection of the interior concrete to check for cracks or abnormalities and take pictures along the way. This process is needlessly dangerous and tedious. Eden is a real estate photographer that gets contracted out to make virtual tours for property owners. Now, what you might not notice at first glance at, in most virtual tours is that Eden is never in the camera shot. 
The way she takes her pictures is by placing her tripod in a room, moving out of the room, clicking and capturing, repositioning the camera several feet away, and repeating the process over and over until the whole property is captured. Then she needs to send her album of 360 photos to a third-party cloud service that takes several days to turn around a virtual tour and a 3D model. Joey is an immersive content cinematographer and currently has difficulty shooting aerial 360 footage. He has to purchase off-the-shelf 360 cameras, make a custom attachment, and do extensive post-processing to edit the drone out of the shot. So our solution is the Vista, a 360 drone with the capability to capture and record all around itself at once. The Vista has Roomba-like functionality to allow it to fly indoors autonomously, taking pictures and stitching virtual tours instantly. The patent-pending design enables the drone to not appear in the shot. One drone, every angle. The content captured can be easily edited and shared from our online software suite. Now, all kinds of drones are being used for a variety of different purposes, but only two drones have true 360-degree video capability. These drones are the Janus VR and the Matrice 600. The Janus VR costs $20,000 and is a drone that requires six GoPros to be attached to the top and the bottom. It's a very bulky system coming in at about two by four feet, much larger than the Vista. The other similar 360 drone competitor is the Matrice 600 and costs $6,000. Neither of these drones can even be flown indoors or have the software included to combine the content from the two cameras into one 360 degree field of view. So we provide a cheaper hardware and software solution at $2,950. I myself as a filmmaker use a drone to capture content. And currently the only way for me to capture 360 aerial footage affordably is to attach two 360 cameras onto my drone using a DIY rig. This seems to be the go-to solution for everyone as far as creating 360 content on a drone. However, it makes it extremely hard and difficult to fly as it changes the center of gravity and weight of the drone, as well as potentially causing interference with its GPS system. Now, I don't know about you, but I wanna make sure I get my equipment back safely. In my case, the drone already cost $1,500. Adding two more $300 360 cameras on top of that unstable platform makes it a liability, not a solution. Our product comes in fully integrated with a native 22 megapixel dual camera system that's already built in and stitches the footage on board in real time. This saves time and potentially thousands for our users. It's small and portable, which makes it easy to carry and allows it to be used in many more applications compared to our competitors. It features object avoidance, which ensures the safety of our pilots and their surroundings. This will give our users the confidence during flight and allow them to venture into previously harder to fly situations. Currently, there is no simple software solution that converts 360 video back into traditional formats. This is where our software comes in at a base price of $25 per month for consumers and $125 per month for commercial use and our enterprise applications. With the software suite, users can easily generate virtual tours, which is already an included service in our subscription. We can also charge extra at additional cost for 3D modeling or dollhouse view creation, as well as 3D model rendering, where we're able to virtually furnish empty properties and or file storage. So the drone market is one of the fastest growing markets in the hardware space. In 2025, the drone market is slated to grow to over $82 billion. Now our B2B entryway into this market is the real estate space. With roughly 6 million homes sold in the US each year and 54% of buyers only picking homes that have a virtual tour, this industry is the lowest hanging fruit. The 2 million realtors that sell these homes and rent out 60 million rental properties a year are always looking for ways to create more engaging content. So we have been directly reaching out to realtors and photographers using their company websites and sales tools like LinkedIn, Sales Navigator, Close, and yet another mail merge. We've identified roughly 40,000 people to reach out to directly in the next two months online. Now we have a plan to launch on Kickstarter by August 2020 with a goal of engaging our customers and closing $200,000 in agreement to support our Kickstarter before we even launch with signed backer agreements. After beginning our sales outreach in March, we have already been able to sign 42 back agreements for $65,000 in pre-sales with the majority of those customers in the real estate photography space. In 2019, we also raised $50,000 from an angel investor who was a UMD alumni and recently raised another 15,000 from the same investor and raised 10K internally from our team. We have filed a prototype, we have five working prototypes and filed a provisional patent. In our first year of sales, we expect to bring in around 600,000 of revenue, primarily hardware sales, and our cost of goods sold will decrease throughout the next two years because our subscription model will increase our revenue from our software sales. At that time, parts will be cheaper and we'll have money coming in from that second revenue stream. We'll be using the Dingman Award primarily for product development and sales and operations, and we'll be using this money to support our Kickstarter online.
So Door Robotics is led by me. I have over three years experience in drone hardware and software design. I'm the CEO. Patrick Crow, who has sold thousands of products on Kickstarters in the past and has over four years experience in startup development. And Vincent Hagen, who is our CMO. Help us build the Roomba for virtual tours. Great, thank you to our robotics. All right, so we'll move to the Q&A portion. Keep showing up. Tom Parsons has a question. Hey guys, the uh, drone, is it only showing 360 underneath the drone or is it above the drone and below the drone? So it's a 360 camera built in, so you can see above, beneath, to the right, to the left, in front, and behind all at once. Great. David Quattrone has a question. Hey, can you talk about, in terms of the, the manufacturing side of things, can you talk a little more about, uh, you know, who you're partnering with and, and how you're going to look to achieve, you know, more volume and scale here? Sure. So we're right now working with two partners. One of them is called Harbor Designs. They're based in Baltimore. They do product development, design, electronics, manufacturing. Uh, we've actually worked with them for our previous prototypes, and we, they've already gotten us really good deals and are willing to work with us down the road. And we're also working with a sourcing partner uh, that has connections in China and overseas, the cheaper and more better connections. Matt Fischlinger has a question. The um, kind of the, the main selling point, you, you mentioned the kind of ability to in real time do the stitching of the 360 video. And you also mentioned kind of the ability to do kind of the Roomba aspect of it and being able to navigate indoors. What is the like kind of the main, is it, is that stitching capability the main focus or is it the ability to kind of um, use it indoors and, and develop that kind of uh, 3D picture and, and uh, you know, inside a facility? Yeah, so the stitching is currently our biggest selling point. The Roomba-like functionality is what is exciting the real estate folks as well. Uh, so with the inspection space, they like having the ability to see all around it at once so that way they don't have to send someone in. And for the 3D 360 videographers, they are currently have to use a variety of different solutions to make the 360. Uh, so we, us offering the software and design that keeps the drone out of the shot and the 360 be stitched together solves problems for all three of those. And because it's a system that we're building from scratch in terms of the hardware, we can also offer online capabilities like autonomous flight and things of that nature. Aurelia Flores has a question. Um, I wanna talk about the market a little bit. So you're, you've definitely articulated why somebody would need it, but I'm curious about what they're paying for now. So if you're selling to photographers that sell into the real estate market, how much are they getting paid right now for what they do? And how much are, how much are they going to have to eat in cost to kind of buy this upfront kind of expensive um, piece of equipment? Sure. So real estate photographers currently spend five to $6,000 on equipment for technologies. Uh, they use this the tripod system that I mentioned in the beginning of the pitch is a $4,000 camera system. Uh, and a lot of them are doing virtual tours five to six times a week especially now with everyone in the shelter and home they have are being required to make even more virtual tours and having to make even more online footage and content. Uh, so they're already budgeting five to $6,000 in just equipment costs. Uh, and we're already undercutting a lot of the drones that are available for what they do. Uh, so the numbers are very comfortable with the customers that we've already reached out to. Thank you, Tom Parsons has a question. Hey guys, one more question. Um, the software, uh, which you said was a, a main point to this drone, is that sold separately or sold as a package with the drone? Does it come all together? Sure, so there's two parts of the software that's important to our users. Uh, the first part is the stitching capability to combine the two camera videos and make one 360 video. Uh, so that comes built in. And then we have a software suite where you can edit the videos to either convert them back to 2D, to make the virtual tour process, to do 3D models and renderings and all the things that you would do with a 3D tool. Uh, we have that service as a product that we're selling along with the drone for $25 a month for consumers and $125 for enterprise. Okay, thank you judges for your questions. So we'll take a transition period. Judges, feel free to take notes, put your scores on your score sheet. And in the meantime, hi, Dres. We'll see if we can get you up and running.
Thank you, Door Robotics. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Charles, if you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Just one moment. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles Grody, and I'm the CEO of Hydrays, the best in class solution for automatic toilet flushing. If you're like me, you've probably used a public restroom and had an automatic toilet flush right underneath of you before you were done. It's really annoying. And sometimes it happens so often that you feel like you're in a water park. This unwanted ticket to the splash zone happens because current toilets or flushometers use distance sensors to determine when to flush, which can be problematic as the user can move back and forth multiple times within a single use. Not only is this an incredibly annoying nuisance to us, but it actually causes a significant amount of water waste. The leading study on this issue of phantom flushing reveals that toilet water consumption increases by 45% with automatic sensors. This number adds up really quickly. At the University of Maryland, with around 200 buildings, we're looking at about 20 million gallons of water wasted every year. That is the equivalent of half a million dollars or 50 students' tuitions literally flushed down the toilet. To solve this problem, we talked to almost every facility manager on campus and some local business owners and learned that if we wanted to save water, we would need to do it by offering a solution that kept toilets cleaner than the existing sensors and offered a one-year return on investment. And that's exactly what we do with our first patent pending idea, a method of automatic flushing based on the activity of the stall latch. If every time the stall latch unlocked, that told the toilet to flush, only flush once, as necessary, as the user is leaving, guaranteeing the same level of cleanliness without a single wasted flush. But we didn't stop there. With our second patent pending idea, we network all latch and flushometer devices to our smart flush platform to provide facilities managers with real-time information and allow them to implement functionality remotely, dramatically improving the performance of every stall. This is usually the part where somebody likes to ask us, why not just switch back to the manually flushing options? Yes, that would solve the problem of phantom flushing. However, facilities managers have told us that the reason they spend hundreds of dollars per toilet on automatic sensors is to guarantee the sanitation of a flush after every use. Our competitors, Sloan, Zern, and Hydrotech can do that, but the problem is they all use the same faulty distance sensing technology, which causes phantom flushes. With our solution, there is no compromise between cleanliness and conservation. Facilities managers have told us that they want a one-year return on investment. So we give it to them by pricing our units at $150 with a small $25 annual subscription fee for the Smart Flush platform. Who exactly do we solve this problem for? There are 27 million flushometers in the US. Through first and secondhand research, we've divided our customers into three segments based on size, lead time, and cost to acquire, as you can see here. We've signed up at least one customer from each of these segments for beta tests, which will, which will yield $4,000 in pre-sales. We have already laid the groundwork for turning this plan into a reality. We started here at the University of Maryland, establishing proof of concept through an initial pilot test in the Clarice Performing Arts Center. From there, we began expanding to local businesses and already have two commercial beta customer signups. Our next step will be to leverage our advisors' connections in facility management in California to expand to the West Coast, where water prices are three times higher and the need for our product is the greatest. Finally, we will target large corporations to help eliminate the $6 billion of phantom flush water waste every year. This plan means that we are on target to break even by next year and start turning large profits thereafter. And we have put together the perfect team to execute this mission. We have four UMD students with business and engineering backgrounds in one of the university's most recognized business honors programs, Quest. With this team, 
we have made a name for ourselves. We filed two utility patent applications and we conducted a pilot test to validate that this was a huge opportunity. We finished our final prototype last January and immediately found five beta sites for testing. We are ready to roll out 50 beta devices to these locations by June. Field testing is the last step before we are ready to hit $100,000 in revenue by the end of the year. Last year, we won the Do Good Challenge for $5,000 and look at everything that followed. Imagine what we can do with 15,000. 8,000 would go towards manufacturing our products. The next 4,000 would go towards marketing and outreach, attending trade shows to meet with facilities managers and to sell to them directly. And the remaining 3,000 would be used to continue patent processing to ensure that we have strong utility patents to protect our inventions. Hydres is not a toilet company. We are drivers of water conservation with a focus on protecting the Earth's most precious resource, and in doing so, we do our part in the battle against climate change. Thank you, you Hydrates. Oh. You can see a video demonstration if you go to our website, and with that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Thanks, awesome, Hydrates. <laughs> All right, Becky Smith has a question. Sure. So um, I saw, and as a marketer, I appreciated you put in some information about cost per lead, and you did mention going to trade shows. What are some of the other ways that you plan to market this um, to folks so that in a way that they would understand kind of what you're selling? So for each of our customer segments, this is a little more detailed slide. We have marketing strategies for each of them. For small businesses like local restaurants, we're gonna focus on using highly targeted Facebook ads as well as cold emails and cold calls. We we'll use some of those same strategies for medium-sized businesses, but also the real value that we found from interacting with our customers is it within face-to-face -face interactions. And usually those come from trade shows, but also warm leads. And those are our primary marketing strategies to get a hold of these people. Once we get in touch with them, they see our product, we show them the savings, we offer them a free demo so they can see the functionality, prove to them the savings. From there, it's an easy purchase. Great, thank you. David Quattrone has a question. I, I, yeah, I guess uh, one of the questions is, you know, you've got, uh, you're, you're adding a mechanism that's going to be opening and closing and is going to be, you know, touched by the consumer and the situation. Have you had any kind of beta feedback on the stability or the long-term maintenance? How often do you get into a situation where the, the mechanism or the sensor goes down versus, you know, the existing model that's more hands-off, so to speak? So as far as durability of the unit itself, I've worked with faculty within the mechanical engineering department to select a plastic material that's really tough and impact resistant, the same kind they use for DeWalt power tools. For our software connectivity, all of the devices will communicate to each other through Bluetooth. So even if Wi-Fi goes down, there's an electrical outage, they'll be running on batteries using Bluetooth, they will still communicate. Even if for some reason that were to go down, which it wouldn't, but if it did, the, all the flushometers will still have a distance sensor inside so they can continue to operate as they do now. Matt Fischlinger has a question. Yeah, just can you find a little bit more about um, how you guys are currently manufacturing it and then as you scale some of where the break points are in, in cost um, as you need to make more of them? Yep. Right now we are manufacturing everything by hand. With the electronics, we are assembling them ourselves. We are 3D printing the enclosures and we will continue to do this for as long as we're making about 50 devices. We've also already begun communication with multiple manufacturers for both electronics and enclosures. We've received some initial samples for electronics assembly from a company called Circuit Hub located in uh, Oregon. And then we've also worked with faculty at the University of Maryland to se select some options for injection molding the latch enclosures. So once we get past the 50 mark, 
that's when we're gonna switch towards having these third parties do the manufacturing for us. We will still continue to assemble the products in-house, either with a team or hiring some people. But once we get to the 10,000 mark, that's when we're gonna have everything manufactured through with professional manufacturers. Last question, judges. Tom Parsons has a question. Hey, Charles. Um, you said that you had one that every, the maintenance managers you talked to wanted a one-year payoff. How did you come up and calculate that one-year payoff with the one hundred fifty dollar and twenty-five dollar annual subscription? It's a good question, and it really starts with a pilot test that we ran the previous year, where we installed devices in the Clary's Performing Arts Center to count the number of phantom flushes. We had these devices connected to the stall latch that counted the number of openings and closings for expected flushes, as well as a electronic module in the flushometer to count the total number of flushes. We subtracted expected from total, and that gave us um, about the number of phantom flushes using Maryland water rates. We're able to estimate the total dollar figure waste of these toilets per year and extrapolate them. So that number is the basis that we're going out off of and we're gonna to continue to validate it in our next round of 50 beta devices this summer. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Charles. Thank you, judges. Thanks. Thank so you all. We'll move into a transition period in which we will get Caroline ready for Sweets by Caroline. Okay, Caroline, are you ready? Awesome. Judges, are you ready? Great, so Caroline, whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. So ever since I was a little girl, I have always loved to bake. And my earliest memory of baking was when my mom and I were baking a cake and she had given me the eggs to hold as she was getting the other ingredients. And I was so afraid of dropping the eggs that I held them so, so tightly. And you can probably imagine what happened next. Yeah, it slaughtered all over me, all over the kitchen. It was a total disaster. Sorry, mom, I know you're watching from the kitchen. My love for baking has evolved from just being a hobby to wanting to share it with the people around me. And that was when I decided to turn my passion into a business. Hi, my name is Caroline and I'm the owner and baker behind Sweets by Caroline. It's the baking business that specializes in custom gluten-free French macarons, as well as cakes, cupcakes, and other desserts for different parties, engagements, weddings, and even corporate events. So what exactly is a French macaron? Many people mistaken a macaron, as the French would say it, with a macaroon. A macaron is an almond-based sandwich cookie and is also known as the impossible cookie because they are very delicate and finicky to make, while a macaroon is a coconut-based cookie. A lot of people have told me that they've attempted to make a macaron and have failed so many times because they're so temperamental and even just an extra gram of sugar can ruin an entire batch. And this is why I've taken the time to perfect my recipe to provide, to produce a delicious crispy and chewy cookie. So not only are they delicious, but they're also high in demand. About an estimated of 32 million Americans have food allergies and 1% of the US population suffers from celiac disease. So as people are trying to hop on the trend of being more health conscious and looking for more convenient and healthy options, places like privately owned coffee shops, wedding and event planners and corporations are looking for ways to get on this trend and provide healthy um, and bite-sized treats for their customers, their clients, and for the employees to fuel them throughout the day. There's a really big need for this as businesses tend to outsource for baked goods. 58% of businesses I've said that they've outsourced because it's difficult to hire a pastry chef as well as providing them um, kitchen space to operate and produce these baked goods. And that is why Sweets by Kellen is very well aware of this and we wanna be the patisserie that these businesses are coming to to get baked goods from. So here are some photos of our current customers at their event and even at home during quarantine. So many people come to us because they want to have personalized desserts and be able to be a part of the process of designing their own desserts for their parties. And especially at a time like this, quarantine and for parties at home. We don't just do a basic vanilla or chocolate. We offer 
unique flavors like Fruity Pebbles and S'mores and provide different packaging options that are great for parties and wedding events and even corporate events. So for our competition, we have three main competitors, Lottery, Olivia Macron, and Dana's Bakery. Tailoring macarons into different shapes and characters is our competitive advantage, as well as providing personalized consulting and making macarons that are a little bigger in proportion. So not only are we big in flavor, but we're also big in profit. So macarons are very profitable because they only take four ingredients to make, almond flour, powdered sugar, granulated sugar, and egg whites. So it costs about 30 cents to make, and this is what a dozen macarons look like, and they retail for $28. So inside you get your variety of macarons, and then you also get a flavor card that tells you what you have inside, as well as how you can care for them and how you can order from us in the future. So over the years, I've been able to generate these revenues all on my own from baking as well as marketing through social media and through my customers as word, of, as word of mouth is really effective because once you have the trust of one customer, they'll tell their friends and family about it and that is how I've been able to have consistent orders every weekend. From launching our website, winning a business pitch competition and expanding our menu to cakes, we were able to hire someone this past summer to help us with marketing and coming to events and helping us set up, as well as next month, expanding into shipping macarons so that everyone at home can have Sweets by Caroline. And recently we were able to partner with Feed the Fight, um, which is an organization that helps provide meals for our healthcare workers and frontliners. And in the future, we wanna introduce ice cream macarons as well as hosting baking classes for people to also learn how to make macarons. So this is where you can come in. With the $15,000, we'll, we'll be able to use the money to rent out commercial kitchen space and be able to meet higher demands as well as producing more efficiently, purchasing commercial tools, being able to pay off vendor fees so that we can go to different vendor events in our community and expand our brand presence, um, purchasing quality ingredients as well as being able to hire staff to meet higher demands and also increase our revenue. So now you can head to sweetsbycaroline.com as we have Mother's Day gift sets that are live for order right now. So thank you and I hope you join me on my journey for Sweets by Caroline. Thank you. Thanks Caroline. Will I accept questions from the judges? Or Aurelia has a question. Are you planning to keep it kind of in-house and, and make it, number one, um, manually? Like, you're, are you planning to kind of outsource it at some point to have, um, I'm thinking of a co-packer, but I don't know if that's the right term in your, in your industry. Are you going to be doing, are you looking to build it to be that big or what's your long-term vision for it? Um, so I do want to go into wholesale and being able to provide macarons for different stores and even doing like subscription boxes for people to order. Um, macarons are very easy to package and ship out to people and um, they last a long time so people are able to get these macarons. So that's why I really want to go into wholesale so that everyone is able to have access to them. Angela Singleton <laughs> has a question. It looks like you specialize in all sorts of baked goods. I just wanted to understand um, what percentage of your sales are from macarons specifically? Yeah, so about 50% to like 70% of my sales are from macarons because people are looking for um, like wedding favors. So they'll order um, a bulk order of macarons for their dessert tables or even for um, gifts, like corporate gifts, and even for um, like, I wanna go into subscription boxes, so being able to do that, but about 50 to 75% of the sales are from macarons. David Quattrone has a question. 
Yeah, I guess this is kind of coming off of the, the first question as well. And, you know, um, you're kind of going from the individual executioner and, and, and custom design and delivery to trying to get it to that next level where you're going to have to figure out how you get staffing to scale. So have you, have you thought about how you're going to strike that balance between volume, but then not losing kind of that individual custom brand that you've been able to, to kind of present over the years? Yeah, so instead of doing like regular um, circular macarons and even like doing um, like the different shapes, we've also tried doing like macarons like this where you can have kind of like your logo sprayed on it, which is a lot easier than having to do like the different characters. So like a Dingman kind of like logo that can be used and being presented to a bunch of people and being able to ship that other than specializing in little character ones. Tom Parsons has a question. Hey, Carolyn, go on the same uh, theme as uh, increasing business and increasing volume. You want to use some of the money for uh, the, the commercial kitchen and commercial tools. Is there a balance or a, a certain target you have to meet of, um, of sales to be able to make it uh, efficient to do that? Mm -hmm. So um, if we're able to get at least 100 macrons, so something like that through like a wedding, um, being able, like people ordering from their weddings, we'll be able to make back profit from over a hundred macrons. So that would be like the cap. Any other questions from the judges? I have one minute left. Oh, Aurelia has a question. You talked about the competition a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you say a little bit more about kind of um, how you compare against the competition? And most importantly, I'm curious about how you are branding yourself inside this market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of these other Macron businesses, they specialize in, they have like just regular circular Macrons and what sets us apart is being able to customize them like into the different characters. And that's something that a lot of these businesses don't um, do. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, what was the other part? Well, just, just branding. I mean, like, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your social media activities, how many people mm -hmm. are following you, how you're engaging with your current customers or potential customers. Yeah, so especially through social media, I feel like people tend to like eat with their eyes first. So when they're able to see like a macaron or like different cakes, like that's how they're really drawn in. So through our Instagram, we're able to have people um, see that and as well as through our website where people can see our services and what, what we provide. And also we want to expand into doing like co-ops with other partnering with different businesses in our community like Vigilante and College Park or Coffee Republic in Rockville and being able to do a co-op with them and have our macarons there. Great, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Caroline. Thanks. And with that, we have finished all of our pitches in Q&A. So judges, you can have a moment to write down your thoughts, uh, fill out your score sheets. And if I can ask the judges to use their breakout room function in their bottom menu to return to their deliberation room, we'll begin the conversation as well as the Dingman team. And for everyone else, we hope that you'll hang on for a little while while we do our judges deliberation and Oliver Schlackey is gonna take over the floor for the halftime show. Oliver, it's all yours. All right, Oliver. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you who have still video going, uh, if you turn off the video from your end, that improves your quality because I will run this session over the normal image that we have from me. So I'm gonna go here into our little uh, trivia night. I hope you can see that, uh, put this on full size. What you need for the trivia night is your cell phone close by because we are going to have a small giveaway here during the trivia night. So if you wanna play and uh, wanna stick around for that, uh, here are the rules of the, of the trivia night. We're gonna have two rounds of questions. And every time you can answer a question, it will give you a, a part of a phone number. I have two phones here with me that are right here. And these phones are up for grabs. So you can win the phones. 
these are not very special, but they come in handy when your regular phone does not work. So here are the rules of the trivia night. We have two rounds of questions. For each question, enter a number. Well, we don't have the answer sheets, but I'll show you one online uh, to complete a phone number. There are seven questions in each round. I will give you the area code. And when you got the phone number, you will call me. When you have completed all this question, you will, should have a full 10 digit phone number. And the first caller who actually calls the right number will win the phone. Uh, so I will announce the caller online and the caller will get this brand new phone in the package and, and so forth. It doesn't have a great calling plan. It's just valid for a month, but you can upload more minutes if you'd like. It's your classic backup phone that you can win. And uh, each additional winner will, uh, each winner will also get a bag of Smith School swag, which we'll send to you when that is safe to do. All right, I hope everybody uh, gets the idea here. I will, I will get this uh, started here and uh, please make basically a room for seven numbers to take down plus an area code. All right, again, here, this is the advertisement for the wonderful super high-end phone. Uh, if you watched Breaking Bad in your previous life, you know what this is also called. This is a so-called burner phone, uh, but it's only a burner phone if you buy this anonymously. I did not buy this anonymously, so whatever you're doing with that, it will come back to me. So please don't do that. All right, so first round. Uh, this is about entrepreneurship language, lingo. And uh, you got to have seven questions and we're going to test whether you know your entrepreneurial language. All right, this is how it works. Let's get uh, started with the first number. So please write down your first three numbers. I give them to you. This is the area code. Area code for the first phone is 240. And now we are going for the first question. All right. First question is, a decacorn. Ever heard this this name? A decacorn. Here are the choices. What is a decacorn? Number one, phone number. You know, this is the number you have to write down for the correct answer. Is it number one? It has beautiful rainbow-colored fur. Number four, it's a startup valued at ten billion. That's when you write the number four down. Uh, and number nine would be, it's a startup, 10% of the size of Amazon. All right. Write down your number, one, four, or number nine. All right. Next round. Second number of the phone. Here we go. The annual rate at which customers stop subscribing to a service is called the number nine is the burn rate for the number eight the turn rate or the number one the churn rate the annual rate at which customers stop subscribing to a service is called burn rate turn rate or churn rate all right next one third number A cottage business is a business that, for the number four, sells mostly handcrafted items on Etsy. For the number six, is located outside a bigger city in a small town. And for the number three, it's a niche lifestyle business that does not scale. All right, those are your choices. A cottage business is a business that sells mostly handcrafted items on Etsy. Is located outside the bigger city in a small town or is a niche lifestyle business that does not scale? Four, six, or three. Okay, those are the first three numbers. Now we're heading to number four. The acronym OPN stands for what? Number three would be an obsessive project manager. The number nine would be one pivot missed. And the number zero stands for other people's money. 
Okay, so for what does the acronym OPM stand? That's the project manager, one pivot missed, and other people's money. All right. Number five, we're getting to number five. There we go. A digital nomad is what? A digital nomad. Number zero would be a person who works only out of Starbucks coffee shops. And number nine would be a person who travels the world while coding. And number seven would be a person who only uses free Wi-Fi to go online. So what is a digital nomad? Person who works out only out of Starbucks coffee shops? person who travels the world while coding, or a person who only uses free Wi-Fi to go online. That should be the, the fifth digit. Six digit, next question. Two more to go for the first phone. Here we go. A person who is receiving sweat equity is what? For the number seven, it's a person who gets shares instead of cash for their work, has to wait until the IPO to get paid, that's the number four. And number five, must work as hard as the founder to get shares. Those are your choices. A person receiving sweat equity, getting shares instead of cash for their work, has to wait until the IPO to get paid, Oh, ho! somebody called early, but I didn't open up the call yet. So I have to stop this. We, we have one more question, guys, because he doesn't know the question yet. I'll have to, whoever called, somebody got lucky. Somebody called. So we, I'll open this one more time. Somebody is trying very hard. Okay. I have one more. One more. And then I open the phone. Last question, gross hacking. Gross hacking describes what? Gross hacking describes for the number one, scaling companies cheaply via social media. <laughs> Guys, I'm not letting it go yet. One more second, I'll tell you in a second when I open the phones. It's a VC who is interested in trade flight valuation for the number two. And number eight would be somebody who is manipulating user numbers by creating fake accounts. All right. Now the phone lines are open. Next person who gets the call. All right, I have a caller. Let me see who that, who that is. Hello, this is Oliver Schlake speaking. Hi, this is Adam Sarstein. Who is that, Adam? Yeah. Okay, Adam. All right, you got, got all the answers right? Where are you calling from, Adam? Where are you calling from, Adam? I'm in Westminster, Maryland. Westminster, Maryland. And what's your relationship to the school? Uh, you're a student, and you could use an extra phone for emergencies, I assume. All right, this is, a, this is a cheap phone, the cheapest I could find. You know, budgets are tight, but it is perfect to have additional, uh, an additional phone uh, that you can put in your backpack or so when you use your precious Android or iPhone. So you're the first winner. Um, if you can uh, find me on the, on the chat, I'm not sure if you see on the chat, but uh, you know, find, you, you'll probably find my name somewhere and send me an email with your contact information. Then I will send you the phone. Thank you very much and congratulations, Adam. Thank you. All right, good. Hey, this worked. First one. First phone is gone. All right. Uh, there's, always, there's always a second chance. So again, I'll take the phone once, uh, once we're, we're doing this. So, by the way, for all of you who are 
who are out there wanted to know the solutions. Here they are for the first round of questions. Startup valued at 10 billion is, uh, is our Dickacorn, the churn rate. Niche lifestyle business doesn't scale, it's the, the cottage business. OPM stands for other people's money. Person who travels the world while coding is our digital nomad. Getting shares instead of cash for their work is sweat equity and scaling companies cheaply with social media. So that's the phone number. And poor little Adam now has a phone that 550,000 people are gonna call. Well, that comes with the price here. All right, we have one more round for everyone. So let's uh, give us another shot here. Uh, now we're talking about numbers. Entrepreneurship is all about numbers and hopefully you are good with your numbers. And I'm gonna turn off his phone because so many people love to call Adam now. All right, again, same area code. Hopefully everybody's ready for the area code. 240 is the area code for the second phone. All right, here we go. First number to go. Oh, sorry. All right, this is about venture capital. How much of all venture capital in the United States goes to female entrepreneurs? Here are your choices. 2.8% for the number four, 29.2% for the number five, was 47.8% for the number nine. All right, how much of all venture capital in the United States goes to female entrepreneurs? All right, first, your first digit. Let's go second digit. Okay, next question. All right, something on the house. The Dingman Center was founded by Rudy, Rudolph Lamone. In what year? Here are your choices for the second digit. For the number one in 1986, for the number two in 1992, and for the number four in 2001. Those are your choices. When did Rudy found the Dingman Center? Of course, in collaboration with Michael Dingman. 1986, 1992, or 2001. That's for your second digit. All right, for the third digit, let's see what we got here. More numbers. Of all startups backed by venture capital, this many fail on average. And you may have different studies there, but that's, I got my numbers from, from my study, so take a wild guess. Of all startups backed by venture capital, this many fail on average. 15% for the number two, 75% for the number three, and 97 for the number six. Of all startups backed by venture capital, this many fail on average. 15, 75, or 97. Right, fourth digit coming up. The IPO, the Google IPO share price was $85 in 2004. It would be valued in November 2019, just to have a high enough number after that, we all know what happened, right? But in November 2019, for about, right? $2,600 for the number six, $15,000 for the number eight. And the third option, there is no option. This is my personal answer and there's no number to it. None of those, I just hate myself for not buying them when I could. Um, so you have two choices. The number six is for $2,600 and the number eight is for 15,000. And that's the, that's the number after stock splits on alphabet, farm out and so forth. So which one is it? The number six for $2,600 or the number eight for $15,000? All right, moving on. Digit number five is coming up. How many times was Colonel Sanders from KFC rejected before his recipe was accepted as the magic formula for Kentucky Fried Chicken? All right, how many times was he rejected? Here we go, these are your options. For number eight, 57 times. 
for the number three, 1,009 times, and for the number four, 243 times. These are your choices. How many times was he rejected? 57 times, 1,009 times, 243 times. All right. Digit number six is coming up. All right, a little bit of math. If you ask the sharks on Shark Tank to pay $120,000 for a 20% stake in your startup, how much is your company worth? At least, how much do you believe it is worth? Here are your options. For the number two, $600,000. For the number seven, $4.8 million. Or for the number four, $1.2 million. These are your options. If you ask the sharks to pay under 20,000 for a 20% stake, how much do you think or hope your company is going to be worth? 600,000, 4.8, 1.2 million. All right, now we're getting to the last. I'm not taking calls, just wait for the screen after this question. Last question. Studies show that a 55 year old, male or female, is to build a success, is fill in the gap to build a successful startup than a 35 year old. All right, just for the balanced demographics in the room. All right, so your choices for the number seven, the 55-year-old is less likely to build a startup than a 35-year-old. Number two, no, I'm not taking the phone call yet. Somebody is very eager. I'll give it a second. I'll give the signal. As likely for number two. And number nine, twice as likely. All right, last choices. Now please call, first one here. All right, I got a call already. So you all guys hear that? I'm gonna take the phone call. All right, uh, come on. Hello, who do I speak with? One more, time, one more time, I need to put you on speaker here. Again. Nubra. Nubra? Nura. Nura, all right. Hi, Nura. You are the winner of the second phone. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. You obviously got all the answers right, or you got seven lucky guesses, one of the, t yeah. one of the two. Congratulations. And where are you calling from, Nubra? Nubra. All right, it's not too far away. And what is the, your your uh, connection to the school? Are you a student? Oh, you're an alumni. Why do you? Well, that's a compliment now because you sound very young. <laughs> All right. Uh, what did you graduate in? All right. Well, congratulations. Um, you probably can easily find my name, Oliver Schlag, and the email. So try to reach out. I'm not going to publish my phone number here, but, uh, but you easily find me. And if not, uh, contact the Dingman Center. They have my information and I have the phone still. Okay, so we will receive the phone um, in the mail. And when you receive it in the mail, leave it out for a couple of days. You know, don't grab it. Um, but uh, congratulations. Thank you very much for playing. Uh, you too. Bye-bye. All right, so we have a second winner, but it's not all. We have one more, one more thing here. Um, I hope we can, can do this too. Uh, stick with me, guys. We're gonna, gonna change to our second, secondary screen. Just one, one moment. All right. We have a tradition here in the, in the program. And the program is always asking, okay, what does, what, what does the, the crowd think who is going to be the winner? And so anybody who is still out there, uh, grab your phones and, or stay online and go to the following website. The website is called menti.com. And then use the code 727590 to type in who should be the winner of the 20. 
20 pitch ding win. There's no price connected. This is absolutely for bragging rights. You know how this goes these days with popular votes. This can last quite a while. And uh, these are your uh, votes here and you see them hopefully developing life. We got high race in the, in the lead. Of course, I mean, everybody is so concerned with toilet paper and flushing these days. Seems there's nothing more important than the toilet paper. For those of you who are not already know it, there is enormous amount of toilet paper available uh, at the University of Maryland. Unfortunately, we cannot go there and get it because the supply chains of toilet paper that is used for personal, to personal use versus the toilet paper that is commercial toilet paper, those supply chains are so very different. So if you want to get toilet paper and you can't get it, just order industrial sized toilet paper rolls, six miles of one ply that is made from recycled paper. That's the big difference between industrial toilet paper and the one that we use at home. We get the cushy one at home. All right, 176 people have already voted. I'll leave it open a couple more, couple more seconds. Let's see, we've got some, got some good votes here. We've got everybody's hungry and, and things of the toilet. That's a tip of the quarantine thought, right? No, but these are great presentations. Don't get me wrong. I'm just making conversation here for everyone. All right. I'm not sure how, 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 the, uh, how far along the conversations are going here in the judging room. They gave me 20 minutes. I think we... All is surpassed 20 minutes. I have one more game here up my sleeve once we're, with, once we're done with the, uh, with the voting. All right, I'll leave it off open another minute. Timer's running, one more minute. Let's see how it's developing. Okay, Hydra is still in the lead, followed by Sweet by Caroline. And then there's a tough fight uh, for the third place. Still Braceland is in the in the third place right now, Elgin Air following, and Do Robotics is a, you know, that's almost a dead heat there. All right. Okay, we got 30 seconds more, and then I close the, close the voting. Let's see here. All right, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, we can call it. Popular vote goes to Hydrace, followed by Sweets by Caroline, and Bracelet in third place. So that's pretty cool. Thank you very much. Boy, I leave the voting open. Maybe you get some other numbers as we go. All right. Not sure. I don't get the signal here that I'm on that I should stop. So uh, let's switch over here one last time to uh, our little competition. Um, for those of you who were wondering what were the answers to the questions, here are the solutions for the second phone winnings. All right, unfortunately only 2.5% of venture capital goes to female entrepreneurs, that is sad. Uh, but unfortunate reality, let's go fix this. And uh, the England Center was founded in 1986. 75% of all venture capital backed companies fail. $2,400, that's how much you would have in your pocket right now for one $85 Google share. It's not too bad, it's not too bad. And uh, yeah, Mr. Colonel Sanders, he failed 1,009 uh, times. He was 21 years old when he started. No, I'm joking. He was actually 50s when he started. But he got, got rejected 1,009 times uh, before somebody accepted his type of recipe in order to create the Kentucky Fried Chicken formula. 600,000 is the value when you pitch it to the sharks, $120,000 for 20%. And... 55-year-olds are two times more likely 
to fund uh, to start a successful startup. So all is not lost for those of us who are in advanced age, and uh, for those of you who'd like to wait, or wait until then. You know, might be another option. All right. So what do we have left? Okay, we have one more game. Uh, one more game left. I don't have a price yet, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm trying to. Uh, Trying to uh, put something out here. Let me see. Let me see if I can can run this here. I don't want to give my. Okay. Here's here's what we do. here's what we do. You can. Um, most people know my email. It's oschlacke at umd.edu. Oschlacke at umd.edu. The first email that I receive with the right answer. It's going to win the prize. Okay, last game. I don't see anybody coming yet. Okay, this this hopefully works. I haven't tested this. Um, the first person who recognizes what is on this picture, it will uncover itself. And the first person who can send an email that I receive here in my oschlake at umd email account we'll get a price, I'll find something. I don't know what it is yet, but I'll definitely have, have a price. So let's make sure oschlake at umd.edu, here's the, here's the game. All right, watch back, Oliver, whenever you're ready. <laughs> I have one more game and then I'm done. It takes only 10 seconds. Okay, watch the screen, whoop. That should not happen. Oh, come on, I busted it. We have, we have a little bit of a, this is how it should look like. Well, still, maybe you didn't get it. Who is on that screen other than me? First email I get at oschlanke at umd.edu with the correct dancer wins. All right. By now you should have an idea. Oh wait, I have a winner. We have a winner. The winner for this, for this competition is Amanda Lopez. Amanda, you're the first email with the correct answer. This is our new president, Daryl Pines. So all of you who played along, thank you very much. This is uh, the end of my time here for the show. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm now turning it back over to Megan with uh, the next elements of the program. So thanks for tuning in guys and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, evening and we're heading out. Thank you very much. Okay, Holly will be giving the awards remarks. Okay, and we're back. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Oliver, for entertaining our guests um, with trivia while we were deliberating. It was a tough deliberation. So I will start with just saying bravo and congratulations to each team that pitched this afternoon. Um, it was a hard decision. And so I want to congratulate you all. It's no easy feat to turn what would have been a live, you know, pitch event in March, a month later into a virtual pitch. So um, you handled it brilliantly, entrepreneurs. So congratulations. So, but this is a competition and we do have to um, select three winners. And the judges were impressed with each, each of the pitches, but I am going to announce um, the winners starting with the third place prize. So, Third place, as you see on your screen here, is again at $3,500. And we have named Door Robotics the third place winner. So congratulations, Josh and Vincent. Nice pitch, um, nice work. Bravo, round of applause. <laughs> um, and now for second place, and as you see, this is a $7,500 prize that Parsons Ventures Inc. has provided. 
And a tough decision, but we have gone with Algin Air on second place. So Dan and Kelsey, again, round of applause. That's probably the worst thing about having this virtually is we can't clap for you, but um, congratulations. Nice pitch, nice work. Um, look to see you grow, so use that money wisely. So, but before um, I announce the grand prize, uh, about a week or so ago, um, and then also we discussed with our judges, um, the team has elected to award funding to those teams who did not place in the top three. These awards are gonna be known as our PPE, our Pandemic Perseverance and Entrepreneurship Awards. So the two teams who did not place third, second, or first will get $1,000 each, just because we think all of you have really just stepped up to the plate here. So I've delayed it long enough. And now after careful deliberation, I am pleased to announce that the 2020 Pitch Demon Competition Grand Prize winner is Hydrays. So congratulations, Charles, on a great pitch and to the team who I know has logged on here and helped you, has been helping you build this startup all along the way. Um, you really convinced the judges that you knew who your market was, you knew the technology, you filed your patents, um, you did all the right things to take home first place. So congratulations to Hydrays. So again, round of applause, I wish um, we could do that, but I am gonna close us out. So thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to the student entrepreneurs who pitched. And as we say these days at the Dingman Center, Keep up the hustle from a safe distance. So stay healthy, everyone, and um, goodbye.